Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Let me ask you a couple of questions before we get started. Uh, have you ever thought about yourself as a brand? Uh, and maybe if you're a business owner, a coach, a consultant, um, you might have thought of that. But maybe the idea applies to us regardless of our role. And you may be saying, Kevin, uh, I don't think that applies to me. I'm going to say au contraire, because I believe before we're done, you will recognize the thinking of and recognize the value of thinking about yourself as a brand. And so uh, welcome to another live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We're not on our normal Monday, we're on Tuesday, uh, but I'm so glad to have you with me. The first episode and that's live in the new year. Uh, if you're here live, please say hello. Tell us where you're located. We'd love to know that as well, of course, as well as taking your questions throughout. Uh, while you're here, I want you to imagine that you're joining uh, us for a cup of coffee. Just share your questions, your comments, and your ideas. It'll make for a better conversation and eventually a better podcast episode. And if you're listening to this on the podcast and you say, wait a minute, I could be asking my questions. I could be with you live, Kevin. Well, you could be. In the future, you can get access to all live episodes and therefore interact with us sooner uh, and interact with us and see them sooner by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to do that. And today's episode is brought to you by Remarkable Masterclasses. Each masterclass is designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. Details on how to get on board for a specific skill or to get discounts each month can be found at remarkablemasterclass.com. Mm -hmm. If we're going to talk about branding today, well, then I ought to have a true expert with us. And here he is. His name is Mike Kim. And let me introduce Mike to you, and then we will dive in. Uh, Mike is a brand strategist for business thought leaders, coaches, and authors who want to make an impact with their ideas and get their messages heard. His refreshing approach has made him a sought after speaker online educator and consultant for top thought leaders. His clients include New York Times bestselling authors and experts featured on PBS, Ted as in TED Talks, on Fox, CNN. He's been featured in and written uh, for Inc., Entrepreneur, and the Huffington Post. He's the author of this book right here. I love this book. That's why he's here. Uh, you Are the Brand, an eight-step blueprint, blueprint to showcase your unique expertise, build a highly profitable and personally fulfilling business. Um, he has spoken to, at industry leading conferences and been on a ton of awesome podcasts. And today he joins us here. Mike, Kim, welcome. Thanks for being here, sir. Kevin, it's an honor. Thank you for having me. And for all those who are tuning in, it, I just hope to add some value to everybody today. Uh, Mike and I were talking before we went live uh, that we've been trying to do this for a while. We started last September and had a hiccup, and then originally we were scheduled for yesterday, and then we had to change it as well. But man, I'm so glad that you're here. You are here. Um, you, I'm guessing you didn't you didn't um, wake up from your dreams as an eight year old saying I'm going to be a brand strategist. In fact, I'm pretty confident, Mike, that that wasn't your original goal. Tell us a little bit about the journey that gets you to this point, uh, just to give people context. Yeah, when I was a kid, I think I wanted to be, uh, I, I wanted to draw comic books. That's what I wanted to do with my life. So um, now here we are, right? Uh, I wasn't that good at it, I guess. Maybe I should just read <laughs> comic books for a living. Um but one thing I've always loved is storytelling. I've always loved good stories. I'm still a story junkie. Uh, I love I love reading a good story. I love watching a good story. I love playing a good story. You know, the, in the past when I was younger and had time to play video games and stuff like that. And um, really, life is all about stories, Kevin. And um, somehow, some way, you know, I've ended up here in this position. Uh, but I started out in the creative arts. I started out in music. I started out as the music director for a church that I, you know, a couple hours away here uh, from New York City in, in, in Connecticut. And what I fell in love with was putting things into music, words, stories that could really impact people's lives. Um, I think that human beings, uh, we resonate with stories because we want to know we're not alone. And we know that we want to know that this journey is not singularly ours. And the more and more that we can tap into each other's narratives and stories, um, the more hope we have, the more encouragement we have, the more 
uh, learning we have and we become better as a human being and as a society, hopefully. And so, um, I went through several career pivots on the, on the very, like, you know, you know, boots on the ground kind of, um, uh, changes that I made. I left that career in, in music and I taught SATs for a little while with high school students. I did that through college. And then, uh, that same company hired me to do their marketing and I realized I knew a lot about marketing because of my music career. And I knew a lot about teaching in general because of how I taught SATs. And when I found marketing, it was a perfect confluence of messaging, organizational growth and leadership, and creativity. And it was just, it was just this perfect kind of storm for me. Um, but really, a lot of my journey just started with being unhappy with where I was and trying to figure out where I was going. And so that's, that's how I, I've ended up here. Mike, I appreciate that. I, I want to share. So, so first of all, everybody, uh, if you've been listening or watching for a while, you know that I almost always ask that question when we start when I'm talking with folks. And there's a couple of reasons, and and there are leadership lessons in both. One of them is uh, it, it gives us an an initial story to put context on my guest or on the guest with for all of you, and so you have a little more of a sense of who Mike is because of that story. Uh, and so it's purposeful in that regard. And it's interesting because you, you talk about stories. And so it, you, you told us, in short, a story about your life and doing that. And the second, another, not the only other reason, but another reason that, I, that I'll relate back to that right now is that for us as leaders, we'll be far more effective when we understand more about the stories of the folks that we lead. And, and obviously, uh, Mike doesn't work for me. Uh, but in the context of today, there's a little bit of that sort of positional difference. And, and so there's maybe some value there. Um, Mike, you you ended up where you belonged, right? And I think that's one of the things that we have in common. We're both doing what I believe we were put on earth to do. Um, and so you wrote this book called You Are the Brand. So let's just start here. Let's just start with what is sort of a, a simple question, certainly a simple question for you. What is a personal brand? Because some people that are listening or watching may have never thought about it, really. What is a personal brand? Yeah, well, it really starts with branding, Kevin. Branding has always been a, about identity. You know, it's whether it was, uh, most people know this, that the concept of branding started with livestock. These farmers would brand you know, an identifying mark onto the hide of their cow and say, that's my cow. If he runs off, uh, it's mine. You know, they, they, I name tagged it. Okay. And so we branded something in there. Now, um, hundreds of years later, you know, and hundreds of years ago, um, we started to see this concept of branding as identity move into the business space. There was a guy named Josiah Wedgwood who was born in the 1700s. He was an English potter. And he entered a pottery competition hosted by Queen Charlotte, won, and in a stroke of genius, started calling all of his pottery Queensware. Because if you imagine at the time, pottery was just in a random shop that he was selling. You know, you'd walk down to Josiah's, you know, shop and buy his nameless, faceless pottery. Well, it after wasn't he wasn't actually won, a pottery barn. It might have been yeah. a pottery barn, but it wasn't yeah. a pottery barn. <laughs> yeah, it didn't have any logos on it. That's for sure. <laughs> and so he started calling all his pottery queensware, opened up showrooms for an affluent market in London, and he pioneered these practices of free delivery and money back guarantees. It wasn't Jeff Bezos, you know. And um, when we think about branding, whether it's livestock or whether it's pottery or whether it's us as human beings or as leaders. Branding has always been about identity. A sneaker is a sneaker until you put a swoosh on it. Now it's a Nike sneaker, right? It's just about identity. So when we talk about a personal brand, what does that mean? It is a public-facing identity that is comprised of four things, I would say. This is what I say. Um, your ideas, your expertise, your reputation, and your personality. And I can't think of a better audience uh, to have this conversation with than with leaders. Because if the first three things all being the same, all things being equal from one leader to another, there are folks who will just like you because of your personality or won't. It has nothing to do with your expertise. It has nothing to do with your ideas. You may have just a, a stellar reputation as the leader next to you. And oftentimes, we don't understand that human beings 
make these decisions on whether we like somebody or not, you know, based on, um, you know, all of these things that are out there. Right. So, um, when I think through, um, what makes a personal brand? It's really a confluence of those four things. Perfect. Ideas, expertise, reputation, and personality. So, so now I think everyone who is watching or listening, whatever that might be, mm-hmm. would say, okay, that makes sense. If, uh, if I'm one of Mike's clients, if I'm an author, if I'm a speaker, if I'm a coach, if I'm a Kevin, even, uh, then the question would be, why does that matter to me as a leader? Why should now, I have an answer for this, and I think it's it's mm-hmm. obvious to me, but I'd really love to hear your thoughts about this. Why should every leader in an organization think about this idea of them as a brand? How, what's the connection there when we're not talking about the, the marketplace in the, the traditional way? Yeah, I, I love this, um, this kind of angle because when you think about a brand and – we're all familiar with thousands of brands. It's the shoes we wear. It's the clothes we wear. It's the cars we drive. It's the companies we trust or don't trust, right? A brand, a brand is simply what people say about you when you're not in the room. And if you're a leader, you need to be paying attention to that. You know, they might sit up straight and um, feign paying attention when you walk into the room. But when you're out of that boardroom or that company meeting or whatever it is, and people are talking smack about you behind your back, you don't, really have as much influence as you think you do. Um, and I would dare say, I would take this a step further. It's not just about what people say about you when you're not in the room. It's it's what people say about before you even get in the room. And if they but don't know what to about say. While you're in the room. Yeah. And that. if you're not shaping that narrative in some way, shape or form or being intentional about it, um, my friend, you're, you're, you're behind the eight ball already. There, we see this at play all the time in business, in leadership, in sports, in celebrity culture, whatever it is, you, in politics. You can say Elon Musk is more famous than Tesla. He's more famous than his own company. And there are people who will follow him and respect him simply because now of who he is, his brand, Mark Cuban, the same thing, who is more famous Even for being more himself, so with Mark, yeah, than say. being the owner of, a, of the Dallas Mavericks that they have immediate buy-in with a large part of their followers, a large part of the marketplace. And so Elon Musk tweeting about cryptocurrency, there's this thing called the halo effect in leadership, where if you're an expert in one niche or industry, people will all automatically assume you know what you're doing in another one, which is why politicians will recruit celebrities who know nothing about politics, let's be honest, to endorse them. There's all this psychological stuff going on. And if you're a leader and you think, I just, all I need to do is be the best. It doesn't, I just need to get the best results. That's all that really matters. Then how come Michael Jordan isn't everyone's favorite basketball player? He's the best who's ever lived. But there are a lot of people who don't like him. It has nothing to do with his expertise. It's his personality. Some people don't like his personality. And if you are in a certain type of organization or role, and um, you're treating everything that you see like a nail because you're a hammer. That's not going to work in certain organizations. You got to understand where you are. I work with a lot of people who are nonprofit organizations. They can't. They top down leadership doesn't work there. Right. You know. So there, there's a lot of a lot of questions as we go into this. So, you know, back to what you were asking. I think branding is re- the reason leaders need to pay attention to this. Is that your people are having conversations about you, whether you realize it or not. It just depends on what conversation they're having. And Mm -hmm. to drive it home, it's impacting how successful you are Mm -hmm. with them, for them, and, and because of them. And so that, that, so one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on, obviously, uh, Mike knows who recommended uh, him to me to have, to, to see the book. And because of my world, you know, I'm interested in this book for the ideas that's in it, be, uh, that are in it because of the work that we do. But I knew that it had impact for all of us here. And and so if you take out the, for those of you that are still, you're hanging with us, but you're still for some reason struggling, the reality is take out the idea, take out the word branding and everything that we've said, you can frame it around role modeling behavior, around your ability to influence, however you want to put it. Because everything about branding ultimately is about influence, which means 
that all of this applies to how we can be helping our team members with their brands, if you will. You want to comment on that? Like, what's our role as a leader? How can we as a leader, I'm a middle manager anywhere in the world, right? And I've got a team of folks. Uh, how, how can I, or what advice would you have for helping them with these ideas? Besides buying a copy of the book, of course. <laughs> Yeah, the book can probably help a little bit uh, here and there. You know, you take what lessons you can glean from it. You know, one of the things that I say there, and, uh, you know, I, this is a hill I'll die on. You know, um, we live in a culture today of image. You know, we social media, you can you can carefully craft a certain image, you know, wh- whichever way you want on Instagram, on LinkedIn even. And I, I don't want people to be mistaken. I'm not talking about building a brand. I'm talking about you becoming who you say you are claim to be you know don't build a brand become the brand become who you're trying to sell to people um and we've seen this all throughout human history kevin like this is nothing new this is a human problem right where we meet leaders who say certain things and then do the complete opposite they make certain promises and break them they tell people how to live and they do the exact opposite they feel they are exempt from these things and Leadership is influence. Leadership is trust. Leadership is what you decide you're going to make it. But in this increasingly openly transparent culture where you can find out anything about anyone based on what they've posted online, the world is starving for integrity. And by integrity, I don't mean morals. I mean, you know, that word integrity comes from integer. It's a mathematical term. It's indivisible. It's a number that is not divisible that whole number, which means that you are who you say you are, you know, all the time. This is just you. And so you're doing the hard work of becoming the person you claim to be or want to be or saying that you are. That's really what I'm talking about. When we talk about middle management, I see people do this all the time. They pass the buck. They talk down to people. They use positional authority to um, give marching orders. Um, But back to our, some of these examples of folks that we've talked about, regardless of what you feel about Elon Musk or Mark Cuban or any of these folks, with a large part of their following, they have an incredible amount of trust. People just trust them. People are just willing to say, I'm going to give this person way more than the benefit of the doubt. They've got my buy-in no matter what they do. And so if you're in middle management, whatever rung you are on the ladder of leadership, um, if you if you are intentional about how you want your leadership to style to be, right? Um, and you allow that to permeate culture. Okay, now we have something that is brandable. This is how we do things here. This is where company culture is born. This is how we do things here. It's not over there. This is how we do things here. You know, you think about Ritz Carlton, I travel a lot, and their their training, their hospitality training is world class. They talk to, they refer to everybody in their training program as ladies and gentlemen. And you don't walk in and say, All right, guys, hey fellas, hey gals, we're gonna it's it's intentional and it can be what you want <laughs> it can be what you want just right. be intentional about it right uh, i love that idea of uh, of becoming you right because there's there are principles of leadership that apply regardless principles of influence and a hundred other things and yet no one can lead like you and that isn't that isn't a Uh, a carte blanche to say, well, I'm not good at this or that, but rather it's to bring ideas, expertise, reputation, and personality. And there's no one else that's quite like you. So one of the things that you talk about in the book, and so I'm going to sort of balance the ideas from the book directly from some of the stuff we're talking about is the idea of platform. And I'd like you to talk about platform really sort of, sort of in in the, from the book's perspective of if I'm, if I'm trying to market, myself in the world if i'm trying to become my brand be my brand what is it what does platform mean so again some people here may not know that term analogy so talk about platform yeah by platform i just mean a stage and we have many stages we have linkedin we have instagram we have youtube we have our emails we have and what i mean by that is that um in this world right of of online communication i tell my students this you are what you share you are what you share. If you think through everything that you're sharing online, that is what people associate you with. Um, now, I know we're not talking specifically about marketing, but one of the things I always say in marketing is that 
marketing isn't about closing a sale. It's about opening a relationship. Yeah. Well, how do you do that? One of my favorite lines in the book, as it cool, turns thanks. out. Thanks. And, and how do you do that? How do you open relationships with people? You talk, you share what you know, you share a little bit about yourself. And this is something that all of us, leaders, employees, team members, wherever you sit on that spectrum, have to understand and learn. There are entire companies right now, Kevin, that don't care about you sending in a CV. They will they will base their decision on whether to hire you or not simply by looking at your Facebook or LinkedIn feeds because they feel like that's the real you. Anyone can doctor up a resume. But if I'm going back three years into your Twitter feed, I'm going to get the real you. And we've seen that happen in cancel culture for better or worse, right? You know, people being canceled from things they posted when they were a kid and you know, 10, 15 years ago. Okay. And th that's a whole other rabbit hole. But the point is you are what you post. You are what you share. And we all have these platforms, whether we realize it or not, it just depends how you use them. Now, I think that as leaders, there is a golden opportunity to be intentional about how we use these platforms to share great ideas, to showcase our, our unique expertise, to establish our reputation and to Showcase a little bit of our personality. All those four things. If we're intentional about them as leaders, you know, I've got my phone here. And honestly, I'd rather lose my wallet than my phone. <laughs> we, I, might because, need, we might need an intervention here, Mike, on that. But go ahead. <laughs> let me explain. You can cancel credit cards. But if someone has the passcode to my phone... They're in everything, all of my photos, all of my social media accounts, all of my email accounts. It's scary. Our entire life's on this phone. Now, let me flip the, so the, the coin. If I have access to somebody on this device, they're willingly raising their digital hand and saying, Mike Kim, I want you to talk to me on the most private device that I own. I want to watch your videos or read your emails or read your tweets or look at your Instagram pictures on this thing while I'm huddled under the covers in bed because I can't go to bed without looking at my phone. That is an incredible level of access. And I see a lot of leaders squandering it. They're not leveraging it. The so, leaders who so are, yeah, are meeting those people. And let me, let me, let me close with this phrase here. Yeah. They're meeting people in their own space and at their own pace. Think about how powerful that is. I don't have to log into a webinar at 1 Eastern to talk or hear from you or learn from you. I don't even need to re like buy a book. I can just sample you by looking at one minute videos on your Instagram or LinkedIn feed. And whether you're a leader in a business or an organization, whether you're a counselor, whether you're a motivational speaker, whether you're a life coach, um, whether you're helping women through pregnancy or helping people through divorce in the toughest times of their life, job loss, you name it. And I can talk to that person in their weakest moments because they say yes to me on their phone. That's influence. That's where trust is built. Holy cow. Right. So, yeah, at their own space and in their in their own place. So we bumped up against a question that I really was hoping that we would get to. And, and the question is, so I'm again, I am not planning to I'm going to talk about me. But if I'm a listener and I'm not planning to write a book, I don't I, we could get to the career aspect of this in a second. But I'm just talking about like I just want to be a better leader for my team. How should or how could or how might. I use social media differently. What advice would you give to me as a sort of, you know, uh, wanting to be a successful leader in an organization? Uh, how, how might I be using social media differently? You bumped up against it, but I'd like you to take us over the bridge. Yeah, I'll, I'll relate a story because one of my best friends, Henry, he's a recruiter for um, a nationally known, you know, food company. And... Uh, <clears throat> We're about the same age. We grew up together since we were like about 11 or 12 years old. He lives five minutes away from me. And um, he, he says, oh, man, I have a training today with my team. And he's a leader. He leads hundreds of people. He has staffed entire uh, supermarkets. You know, if I named the name, everyone would know it um, in New York City. And um, 
he's like, I don't know what to say in the training. And I'm like, what, well, what do you believe? And he's having trouble creating content. Right. But he's a strong leader. And so, um, I help him come up with some, some talking points for a presentation. And he goes, yo, everybody loved it after I was like, yeah, you should share that on your LinkedIn feed. He was like, what? Uh, who am I to tell people? I'm like, what do you mean? Who are you to tell people? Your company just had you tell everybody what you learned. And I just helped him with this content. So right there on a base level, if you are sharing things on your platform, whatever channel you use, things that you're learning that help you become a better leader, share it with your team. Because what that does is it and, brands and in person, their mind. Right? Yeah. In Henry's it brands case, in their mind. Mm -hmm. It brands in their mind. Henry's a learner. He's, he's, he, he wants to excel. He's hungry to succeed. He's hungry to do better. That's a leader worth following. I don't care what they say to you at happy hour at the bar. You're so relatable. I love hanging out with you. You're such a chill person. Lies. Because <laughs> when push comes to shove, when things need to get done, people want leaders who they respect. People want leaders who they know are making themselves better. And your platform is a way to showcase that. A lot of, I, I work with a lot of people who are coming out of corporate and they want to start their own business um, as, as an expert in some way, shape, or form. And I just say, they, they say to me all, oftentimes, Kevin, I don't know what to share. I said, well, do you read any books? They're like, yeah. I was like, well, then share that you read these books. Share five quotes from the book that resonated with you. Yeah, but it's not my book. It doesn't matter. It brands in people's minds that you're a learner, that you're growing. Um, I'm in a little different space. I haven't been in corporate for a little while, but I certainly am still a leader. I have to lead my team. I have to lead my contractors. I have to lead my employees and I have to lead my tribe. And it's so funny, Kevin, because I post things and I'm a little bit more, I, I showcase a little bit more of my personality uh, in my, in my feeds, right? Because people get plenty of my know-how through podcasts and other things in the book and whatever. And I post, uh, you know, about two months, two, three months ago, I started kickboxing lessons. Okay. What in the world does that have to do with leadership? What does that have? I post about it all the time. And you know what? I know what's happening. People are saying, that Mike Kim guy, he never settles. He's always trying to push himself in new ways. He's pushing himself physically, mentally, um, emotionally, spiritually. And I, I don't just post a picture of me throwing a kick or getting hit in the face. I will put in the caption, here's what I've learned about myself from kickboxing. I'm a lot weaker than I thought in certain areas. You know, um, I've, I've learned that, um, you know, here's something my trainer taught me when we're sparring, he pushes me into the other fighter from the back when we're sparring. He has his hand on the small of my back and he's consistently pushing me into the other fighter. And I said, why are you doing that? He's like, because you think that it's going to hurt more if you're closer to that guy. It's actually going to hurt more if he has full extension on a punch right to your face. And I was like, that's a life lesson. You know, learn to lean into your pain, lean into the enemy, lean into your adversary. I turned that into a life lesson and people are like, wow, I never would have imagined that from kickboxing. And the other thing is, and neither would you have had you exactly. not. So there's a, there's a whole other conversation that I'm confident you and I could have. We don't have time for it, which is just that point of, you know, one of the things I love about social media in the, in the way that I use it and in the way that you use it, although we don't use exactly the same, uh, is that it forces us or encourages us to reflect. What you just yeah. told was a story of reflection of, I, aha, I did something, I learned something, and then I, here, here's the lesson that I take from that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, any leader who does something like that, sure, in the beginning, you're going to have people say things like, oh, you know, you're being ridiculous. That, that's so stupid. Look at look at Mike. He's trying to be all philosophical or Zen or something like that. I had the same thing happen to me, Kevin. We all start from zero. I didn't go on eBay and buy my personal brand. I didn't go on eBay and buy my followers or my influence. I earned it, you know, but I earned it by becoming a better version of myself. Becoming a better co communicator. One of the big questions I ask in the book, and I, I lay this out for all leaders, who do you have to become in order to serve the people you want to serve? Do you have to become a better content creator? Do you have to become a more intelligent um, distiller of thoughts and life lessons? Do you have to become more inspiring? Do you have to become more vulnerable and open? 
And whatever that journey looks like is different for each and every one of us. But the one thing I do know it will require all of us, uh, of all of us, is courage. Yeah, 100%. Is to step out there, you know, and put ourselves out there and and ask ourselves, like, really honest questions. Am I going to use my Instagram feed to post pictures of my food? Or am I going to use it to really help the people that I've influenced with? Because if you have fi- even 50 followers... That's a room full. Of, that's a that's two classrooms in high school full of people who are watching you. Yeah. You decide as a leader. You decide. You know. You decide. I love that. I'm going to ask a a, a a different kind of question here, and then I'm going to start round it round our way into finishing mm-hmm. here, Mike. Um, be, because you spend so much time, and you've mentioned several platforms, and you're available on all of them. You can look up Mike Kim TV on pick your platform. Pretty much going to find Mike. Um, where do you th- now just sort of a, a curious question maybe for all of us uh, a year from now where what are we going to be seeing uh in social media for business like how is it going to change what's going to change um and any any thoughts about that at all yeah it's you know there's there's i think that with social media and some of these channels for business they're going to become more and more controlled um, here's where I'm getting this from. You're already seeing this happen with YouTube. You know, there's this you know, the thing called the algorithm, right? People are always fighting against the algorithm, Facebook, the algorithm, right? Instagram, the algorithm, YouTube, the algorithm. But beyond that, um, one of the, one of the things that happened this past year, you know, this year, last year, you know, we're right into the new year right now, um, yeah, right. is that YouTube started to hide the number of dislikes on a video. You can see how many likes there are on a video, but now you can no longer see how many dislikes there are on a video unless you're the content creator of that video and you log into the back end and you see it. And they came up with this reasoning that, um, you know, seeing the down votes on a video isn't good for new creators and it's going to be discouraging that for them to see negativity on the content they create. And when I read that, I was like, that is such a lie. That is, that's, that's such a lie. They're doing it. Now, I don't care. I'm not going to get super political here, but they're doing it because all videos that include Joe Biden are getting downvoted like crazy. They are. It doesn't matter if you're on CNN, Fox, a liberal news network, conservative network, anything that's featuring a Biden story started to get like 10,000, 20,000 downvotes. And it was a way for his political detractors or opponents to say, we don't agree with this person. We don't like this person. And so they're starting to use these social proof in a way to express their discontent. Right. And they wouldn't have done it, you know, with Trump because they love Trump getting negative press because he got a lot of, you know, eyeballs and clicks. Let's be honest. He was brilliant for all of these marketing and uh, uh, media platforms. Right. And so as you're seeing this start to slowly creep in, Um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I am a marketer. Um, They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. And so when you have too many people having their own voice to the point that it can overpower what the people who created the platform want to do with it, you start to get deplatformed. And I'm, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of YouTube creators who are related to one another in industry or niche. I follow a lot of educational content on YouTube, like stuff about, you know, the fun facts about this country or what really happens in outer space. I love those videos. And I've found that, you know, three to five of the biggest channels on YouTube have now started to band together and create exclusive content on their own platform off of YouTube that you can subscribe to for free. They're not even charging money. They just don't want to deal with the algorithm and the risk of getting deplatformed. So it might not happen in a year, Kevin, but I do see us moving towards that. I see us moving towards that. Um, Even with Facebook changing their whole company name to Meta, you know, they're trying to um, point the attention towards this whole new thing called the metaverse and NFTs and cryptocurrency within that world. And there's just going to be all this confusing talk. And I think you're going to see this, you know, a number of people just dive completely into that and forward thinking companies are going to be there. You know, I'm already seeing companies like Coca-Cola, these huge global brands buying virtual real estate inside the metaverse so that their ads are already there. 
And then they're going to be a contingent of consumers who say, no, thanks. I don't want, I don't want to live in a virtual world. I'm going to go buy a house out in the country and get off range. Right. And so whatever it takes to get to that point is what's going to happen next year. <laughs> and what's going to happen in the next three years and the next five years. But I will say this as leaders, right. And this all circles back to this. Right now, we have these social media platforms where we can talk about this kind of stuff, you know, and, and by and large, we're still free and clear, despite YouTube making some changes and Facebook making some changes. I tell people all the time, the most valuable platform I own is my email list, by and large, because I get right back on people's phones, no algorithm to deal with. They've said yes. I know that 35% of people who get the email will read it, or they'll at least open it. And they're seeing my name over and over again on the most intimate device that they own. And I can't be deplatformed. No one can take that email list from me. I own it. And so that's where I put my, yeah. They don't even have to open all of them. When they keep seeing them, yep. they keep being reminded from the times mm -hmm. that they did open them. Um, yeah. We are talking with Mike Kim, the author of You Are the Brand, uh, this great book. And you can learn more by going to MikeKim.com. I'm going to put that up there. But I have a couple other questions. Other than kickboxing, Mike, what do you do for fun? Wow. Maybe that's well, not even fun. That might have been a bad guess. I don't know. No, it's uh, a lot of fun. fun? Um, it's anything combat training. Uh, but out to, before that, I like I like to play golf. I like to get out into nature. Anything that makes me feel grounded. Um, I spend too much of my work life in front of a computer screen. So anything that gets me into my body, right, reminds me that I'm a human being, right? Uh, bare feet in sand or bare feet on grass. Anything that helps me feel grounded in that regard uh, is good for me um, that uh, even cooking is really good for me, Kevin, because I, you know, when I'm working, I don't use one of my five senses smell. I don't smell anything, right? I just smell my computer. Right. Um, so just having anything tactile, having anything that I can touch and feel and, and that engages my senses is really good for me. Um, and typical of all those other things, like a lot of people like to travel, uh, eat good food, try all that stuff. But all of that comes back to the same thing I just shared. Like it's just being in your body, uh, feeling, sensory, you know, anything along those lines. It's just really good for me. Perfect. Uh, one last question for you. Well, one of two last questions for you. Uh, what are you reading these days, Mike? The most recent book I read um, is a business book, which is, you know, interesting because I haven't read one in a little while. Uh, but it's called The Gap in the Gain by Dan Sullivan. Um, I had some friends recommend it and, uh, my biggest takeaway from the book were just these questions that they ask you. The, the concept is to always measure your life backwards, like see how far you've come. And it sounds very elementary and simple until I did the exercise and they were really eye opening to me. So I asked myself some questions, you know, 10 years ago, where was I, what was I focused on? How did I measure success back then? And then I answered those questions. I was like, wow, a lot's happened in 10 years. And then I went back to three years ago and asked myself the same questions. Where was I? How did I measure success? What was I focused on? Right. And what did I learn since then? And then even just 12 months ago, where was I? How did I measure success? What was I focused on? And it really showed me, Kevin, how far I've grown, not just as a business person or an entrepreneur or in my career, but as a human being. And I, and I, I just continually remind myself to stay in the gains, to remember how far I've come. Um, one other book, I wouldn't say it's a book I read, but it's a book I use is something called the five minute journal. And you journal in it five minutes a day has some gratitude prompts. It helps you focus on what went right today what you're grateful for. And I'll be honest, I thought this was the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Right? I was like, how is this supposed to be helpful? Um, I journal already, you know, what? how can this be helpful? And um, I just found myself hungry to find a new way to record my life, document my life. And I've been using this now for seven months. And I now, the, the gratitude practice has become so ingrained in me. It's changed the way I think. I automatically default to what went right. Even if something goes wrong, I'm like, what can I learn from this? You know, it, it's taught me to reframe so much to the point that I now require everyone who's in a mastermind group with me to use it for 30 days and try it out. 
because I don't want to be around a bunch of ungrateful leaders and ungrateful right. entrepreneurs. And we're, we, it's not that we aren't. We're just so focused on the next thing. We think that we don't have any wins or successes. We do. We just do a lousy job of tracking them. Exactly. So, because yeah, we're so focused minutes, on next, we're not yeah. looking at where we are, where we've been. I love yeah. that. So, so Mike, uh, other than going to MikeKim.com, uh, anything else that you want to point people to where they can learn more about the book? Anything else you want to say here? Yeah. So You Are the Brand is available. Amazon's probably the easiest place to get it. You can get the ebook, you can get a hard copy, or you can get the audiobook on Audible. Is for It's available now. I read it. And so uh, just tune in. It's it's really affordable right now for whatever reason. I think the publisher knocked it down um, with the new year. So you can get it for a couple bucks. And um, just type You Are the Brand or Mike Kim into Amazon and you can grab a copy there. And if you like podcasts, I have a podcast called You Are the Brand by the same name. Um, it's not really leadership focused. It's more for solopreneurs who are starting their own personal brand business as a coach, speaker, expert. Um, but you can find me there as well. Before we go, uh, thank you for that, Mike. Um, before we go, everybody, the question I ask you every week, it's now what? Okay, what are you going to do with this? And you may be saying, Kevin, this one was a little different. I knew that going in, and I was excited to push you a little bit, to help you think in a new way, to maybe reframe some things that you've thought about before. But the question now is, what are you going to do differently as a result of being here? And maybe it's as simple as rethinking what you choose to do with your social media, maybe rethinking uh, how valuable that might be. Maybe it's rethinking how your team sees you and how you show up and how you role model things. There's a, there's a hundred things that we talked about today. Maybe it's simply thinking about ideas, expertise, reputation, reputation, and personality uh, as a way to think about how people see you. The real challenge, though, is to take action as a result of being here. If you don't do that, sort of what was the point? I mean, Mike and I are fun, but yeah. all that matters <laughs> is that you take some action as a result. Uh, so it's been a Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Thanks so much. It was worth the wait. Uh, I'm glad that I'm glad to have had you. And thanks so much for being with me today. It was an honor to be here. And I hope that uh, I was able to add some value to everybody. Just go lead. Just go make a difference. We need you. People, we need you. Leaders, we need you. So go make some positive change in the world. If you found, I, I agree with Mike 100%. It's a perfect way to end. I'll simply say, if you found this useful, invite someone to join you. Uh, invite someone else to the podcast and if, for a future episode. Come back to another live one another day. Hope that you'll do that. And I'll be back next week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everybody.